that the United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden, the leader of al-Qaeda. President Barack Obama announcing to the world that U.S. soldiers had found and killed the most wanted man on the planet. Five years on, what impact has the legacy of Osama bin Laden had on American policy makers and on how the West deals with the Muslim world? And has the so-called war on terror made us all any safer? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Fauzia Ibrahim. It was an emotional moment for many Americans. The man who orchestrated the killing of more than 3,000 people on September 11, 2001 and evaded capture for years was dead. But five years after his controversial killing, Osama bin Laden's message lives on. Inspiring a new generation of armed groups around the world, many of them more violent than al-Qaeda. For Muslims, bin Laden was the face of a global militancy that hijacked their religion, as well as the man who triggered the so-called War on Terror, a campaign which has come to define American foreign policy post 9-11 and which continues to shape the relationship of many countries with the Muslim world. Let's get straight into the discussion now and bring in our guests. Joining us from Washington, D.C., David Gartenstein Ross, Senior Fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. In Birmingham, Afshin Shahi, Director of the Center for the Study of Political Islam. And in Beirut, Ahmad Musali, Professor of Political Science at the American University of Beirut. Welcome, gentlemen, to all of you. Now, we hear a lot about the impact that the war on terror has had on Western nations. We hardly ever hear about the impact on Muslim nations as well. Uh, Mr. Musali, if I could start with you, I want to talk about the individual level. Many Muslims have complained that because of the war on terror, they have felt discriminated, ostracized, and have had to justify their presence and their religion in the wider community. What's been the fallout of this? Well, definitely, I think the war on terrorism has gone astray and it has not targeted the uh, you know players that should have been targeted from the very beginning it turned out now into a com as we are seeing it a conflict that is taking some civilizational dimensions as well as going back to the uh, old game the west against the rest and i think a lot of muslim individuals as well as countries and groups feel that they are discriminated against, especially after <coughs> the invasion of Iraq and the fallout that came out from that. And what we are seeing today, the rise of the level of violence and the creation of Daesh mm -hmm. and the creation of an Islamic state in Syria and Iraq mm -hmm. is a direct repercussion of the uh, war on terrorism that is not really working at all. On the contrary, I think, uh, we can explain later if you want, it has increased the level of terrorism, violence, and uh, the level of destroying the quote-unquote nation-state in the Arab world. And we will see more beyond in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and other countries as well. We definitely will touch uh, on, on that uh, issue. We will come back to that. Mr. Shahi, though, a lot of people have said that the war on terror has actually brought about a clash of civilizations, shall we say. How has the Muslim world, Muslim governments, Muslim nations, and indiv indeed individual Muslims reacted to the linkage of their religion to violent acts that we've seen in the media? Yes, I mean, uh, without any doubt, uh, some people have portrayed the so-called war against terror uh, as a war between uh, different civilizations and different belief systems and different uh, value systems. But we need to be very clear, from the very beginning of the so-called uh, war against terror, there was a lot of confusion about this term, terror. 
What do you mean exactly? Who is the enemy here? The war against terror. Terrorism is not an enemy. Terrorism is a tactic that some sub-state actors like Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State use in order to basically utilize the political sphere in order to gain a concession. So from the very beginning, the very term uh, the kind of war on terror was a false metaphor which basically paved the way to a lot of uh, abuse and paved the way to a lot of misuse uh, of uh, security policies which were implemented certainly uh, in the, within the West which certainly undermined uh, the human rights and beyond beyond the West the idea and the practices and the policies which were connected uh, to uh, war uh, on terror certainly widened the division uh, between the West and the East, and it created these extremely simplistic binaries of us versus them, black versus white, civilized versus uncivilized. And unfortunately, these kind of simplistic binaries of us versus them are being abused and used by some other uh, organizations like the Islamic State, and they are using these terms, the, using these binaries, using these discourses in order to recruit more and more people and using exactly the same ideas uh, to, uh, to their benefit. Well, that being the case, I, I want to take up this interesting issue that the war on terror has been used, or the policies that are linked to uh, the war on terror have been used and abused, particularly for the benefit of certain individuals or groups. Uh, Mr. Garsten, Gartenstein uh, Ross, if you could come into the discussion here and explain to us how do you see these policies that are linked to the war on terror? How has that been used by certain governments, perhaps, to benefit their own interests? That certainly has been the case. I mean, uh, I, I think the last guest in point to simplistic binaries is a uh, point to something which I think has characterized this discussion so far, in that you've been taking all of the post-9-11 policies and uh, putting them under a single umbrella, that of a U.S.-led uh, global war on terror. Many policies can be attributed to, to that, some of which uh, were quite bad, some of which were uh, fairly uh, beneficial in terms of preventing future attacks. Uh, but this is a problem that uh, numerous governments have had to deal with. I just got back from Nigeria. Uh, the problem of Boko Haram is one which they would have to deal with uh, regardless of the uh, war on terror. Uh, likewise, uh, in a number of Middle Eastern states, uh, the policies that you're facing are a little bit delinked from that. So let's take uh, one of the things which I think has been most harmful uh, that, that, that has led to a lot of the uh, jihadist violence of the uh, past five years, and that is the NATO invasion of Libya. Uh, that, wasn't uh, that wasn't actually at all a war on terror policy, and I think that, in fact, had the U.S. and NATO and the Arab League been more attuned to the dangers of jihadists exploiting uh, the uh, kind of uh, gap that this left in Libya, they would have been more hesitant to go in. The reason why that was undertaken had nothing to do with terrorism, but rather the reason they went into Libya was to stop Gaddafi from slaughtering people in Benghazi, uh, and uh, there was a, quite a bit of mission creep that occurred thereafter where they actually wanted to topple Gaddafi. Now, to be very clear, that then left a major, uh, major gap in the area where uh, the Libyan military was destroyed. It never got reconstituted. Uh, you had Tuareg mercenaries who'd fought for Gaddafi, who went into northern Mali, destabilized it, leading to al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb's takeover. And today, the problem in Libya, including the Islamic State and al-Qaeda, fundamentally threatens the transition uh, in Tunisia. Egypt has its own set of problems, but Libya also threatens it as well. So sometimes the policy has been related to the war on terror, and those of uh, uh, I, I wrote a book back in 2011 uh, that came out uh, just after the 10th anniversary of 9/11, of which critiqued our war on terror policies. But at the same time, we can't put everything under that blanket umbrella. And sometimes the problem, in fact, is not paying enough attention to the threat posed of sub-state groups, and thus blundering into places like Libya. It's interesting that you say uh, the war on terror has definitely spawned other terror groups, and, and definitely a feeling that terrorism has increased uh, in the world as well. But let's let's go back to the issue of Al Qaeda, how it's changed and how it's actually spurned more terrorism, more fear in the world. So how has Al Qaeda changed since Bin Laden's death in 2011? Well, Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, based in Yemen, has become the group's most active affiliate, taking advantage of the chaos brought on there by the war. And Al-Qaeda in the Sahel region of Africa has successfully recruited and trained hundreds of new fighters, particularly in Mali. 
But in many ways, al-Qaeda has been overshadowed by the emergence of the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. Now, ISIL conquered and is governing large areas of territory in Iraq and Syria, setting up their vision of a caliphate al-Qaeda was patiently waiting to create. As a result, some al-Qaeda affiliates, such as Boko Haram in Nigeria, have shifted their allegiances to ISIL instead. Uh, Mr. Gartenstein Ross, does this now make Al Qaeda irrelevant in the world, particularly in the face of far more violent groups like ISIL and Boko Haram? Not in any way, shape, or form. In fact, I think uh, it's becoming increasingly clear that Al Qaeda poses the greater long term threat than ISIL. Uh, a lot of the difference between the two groups goes back to Al Qaeda in Iraq's defeat back in the 2007 to 09 period. Al Qaeda in Iraq, of course, later became ISIL. Uh, now, when, when it got defeated, there were several reasons for this. And, and look, everybody degree, agrees that it got defeated. Al Qaeda views it as having been defeated, the U.S. did. And Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi had to basically rebuild the organization from scratch. And unfortunately, uh, there were a lot of openings that he had for reasons related to Syria and related to the Iraqi political situation. Uh, but when al-Qaeda looked at that period, uh, they looked in particular at the Sahwa, or the Awakening Movement, which was a grassroots uprising against al-Qaeda. And their view was that they lost the population. After 07 to 09, al-Qaeda sought to become more population-centric, to embed itself with populations, to work alongside local militant groups without dominating them, and to reduce its level of on-camera violence, not to become uh, an organization that doesn't use brutality, they certainly do, but to, in contrast to ISIL, keep that brutality off camera. Now, when you get to ISIL split from al-Qaeda, when it was expelled from the al-Qaeda organization, al-Qaeda has continued its pivot while ISIL has become more and more violent. Uh, al-Qaeda contrasts itself to ISIL, doing this very explicitly in its propaganda, saying, look, mm -hmm. those are the real Kharijites. We're actually a moderate organization, portraying themselves as, quote unquote, moderate jihadists. Uh, furthermore, if you look at their approach in Syria, where Jabhat al-Nusra works beside a, a wide range of uh, local militant groups, and in Yemen, where they've embedded themselves with the tribes, they've done a very good job of becoming population-centric. Now, you're right that Boko Haram did leave uh, the al-Qaeda ambit. It was never uh, officially recognized as an affiliate, but I certainly agree that it was uh, part of al-Qaeda's orbit uh, before it left for ISIL. I just got back from Nigeria. I got back uh, on Saturday, and I can tell you for a fact that Boko Haram is experiencing buyer's remorse right now, because al-Qaeda is much stronger than ISIL is in the Sahel region region. And so rather than having uh, a uh, base of operations outside of Nigeria that's right next door in the Sahel, they have to go all the way up to Libya, which makes them a weaker organization, including the fact that mm -hmm. al-Qaeda simply has more resources in Africa. So right. about a year ago, a lot of the talk was how uh, al-Qaeda had become irrelevant. Today, I think it's very clear that it hasn't at all. Mr. Shahi, I want to bring you into the conversation here. Would you agree that perhaps al-Qaeda, while perhaps remaining a little less prominent these days in the face of ISIL and Boko Haram and even the Taliban, would you say that they have far more staying power, so to speak, than these other groups? I mean, ISIS, uh, which in a way, uh, as you know, uh, kind of regenerated itself uh, out of uh, uh, Al-Qaeda had a very, very effective, if I may use this term, marketing strategy to make itself kind of the most relevant and the most important and the most vicious uh, uh, terrorist organization uh, in the region. And for that reason, certainly over the last uh, couple of years, they've been able to get a lot of attention uh, regionally and uh, internationally. And obviously, the weaknesses uh, of uh, states, both in Iraq and Syria, uh, helped them, helped the Islamic State uh, to gain uh, a lot of uh, territory. But that doesn't, as, as uh, the, the previous speaker said uh, brightly, that doesn't mean uh, Al-Qaeda has uh, lost its uh, imminent. Mm -hmm. After all, the kind of ideas which were kind of championed uh, by uh, Al-Qaeda for years and years are now being kind of adopted again by the Islamic State. Over the last six or seven months, we know that the Islamic State is under retreat, is under a great deal of pressure. And now we see that 
even the so-called Islamic State are going back to the same policies, the old classic traditional policies uh, of uh, Al-Qaeda. I call this Al-Qaedaization of the Islamic State. We see that, you know, they are increasingly resorting uh, to uh, the politics of fear, the kind of things that mm. we have seen uh, recently uh, in Paris and Iraq in mm. order to gain concession, just exactly in the same way that Al-Qaeda used to do uh, from uh, 2001 uh, to uh, mm -hmm. 2011. Mm -hmm. So again, it would be uh, extremely simplistic to assume that the very fact that they haven't been able to get a lot of attention in the same way that ISIS has been, mm -hmm. they are ir irrelevant. And as you mentioned it yourself, uh, over the last year, they proved that they still have a great deal of ability to work with local forces uh, and local tribes to uh, govern a great deal of area, a great chunk of area uh, in right. Yemen. Uh, right. And at the same time, as, as they proved that in uh, 2015, what happened with Charlie uh, Hebdo atrocities, they, all, they still have the ability uh, to orchestrate uh, uh, extremely problematic uh, operations outside uh, the Middle East and outside the region and in Europe. Mr. Musali, the one thing that binds Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, Boko Haram and ISIL is the need and aim to establish an Islamic caliphate. Is it time that we accept the fact that every drone, every bomb, every attack on a village does nothing to weaken this ideology? Well, I think uh, one has to look at uh, this phenomenon as the rise of uh, Islamic jihadist Salafism. And within it, there are different formations. Mm -hmm. uh, ISIS, I think, uh, in the long run, will be proven to be only one formation of Al-Qaeda. And I agree with your guest that Al-Qaeda is there to stay and will stay regardless of the formation. If today we crush the Islamic State, I think we will see the integration of the different uh, groups and people again into Al-Qaeda. We are witnessing uh, uh, the uh, collapse of the Arab system or if you want the system of state in the Middle East and I think what helped in doing this is the destruction of Iraq and I think it has a lot to do with Iraq we cannot say it doesn't mm -hmm. and uh, the example that your guest gave Libya is a marginal example but also it shows that the destruction of the system that uh, was supposed to be replaced by a middle, a new Middle East, mm -hmm. backfired, and instead uh, we are seeing the rise of and formations of different Al Qaeda and Salafist jihadist group. Today, the fight is not only with a military force. I think that will happen sometime in the future. Mm -hmm. But as we speak today. The uh, ideology of uh, jihadist Salafism is being spread all over the world, not only in the Arab or the Islamic world, but even beyond that. The danger is, I think, and the question at the same time is what to do and how to develop this area. It's not enough to say we have these groups, and I don't want to say you know, go back into east-west, because mm -hmm. these groups are killing Muslims before others, are kill killing Sunnis before right. Shia, and so on and so forth. So it's not, you know, a two-dimensional right. uh, fight, although sometimes when it happens in the west, it takes the right. view that it is the Islam against western culture and so it is not no let, and, it's uh, not but, but let's in, let's fact, focus on what the let, let's focus on what the muslim world has done for the war on terror or how to battle the war on terror shall we say mr shahi how do you see the muslim world muslim governments how have they shaped their foreign and domestic policies in the light of this war on terror and has it worked i think in a way um, I think if you do look at what has been happening in the region uh, over the last uh, five years, uh, the international relations of the Middle East, the foreign policy of uh, important actors like Iran and Saudi Arabia, in a way, have 
pave the way uh, to uh, further empowerment of these sub-state actors. Now we know that the main currency, the main ideological currency in the region is sectarianism. Mm -hmm. Various states like the Islamic Republic of Iran and Saudi Arabia have been using sectarian binaries, using sectarian perspectives in order to broaden uh, their own interests and spheres of interest in the region. And of course, these ideas, these sectarian perspectives and these kind of sectarian policies had a lot of implications, important implications uh, for sub-state actors. Now for organizations like the Islamic State, mm -hmm. It's much easier to create these binaries of us versus them, black versus white, Sunni versus Shia. Because in a way, the international relations of the Middle East to a very large degree mm -hmm. is conditioned by these sectarian perspectives. So in my opinion, most of the actors, most of the important actors in the region, in the Middle East uh, and the wider Arab world, in a way, not only they have helped to mm -hmm. prevent and minimize uh, Islamic radicalization, jihadi ra radicalization, but they even embraced it, not, not necessarily embraced it because they wanted to endorse it, but their policies directly or indirectly paved the way mm -hmm. uh, to their further uh, empowerment and it helped certainly their recruitment and the way in which they legitimize themselves and rationalize themselves. We've been looking at the wider picture on how the war on terror has affected uh, domestic as well foreign issues. Now, the global fight against armed groups like al-Qaeda is having far-reaching effects, as I mentioned, on foreign policy as well as geopolitics, but it's also affecting our own individual lives every day. There's been a rise in xenophobia around the world. Deportations from the U.S. have doubled since 9-11, and European politicians have proposed laws against dual citizenships. Airport security has changed dramatically. There are now full-body scanners and new restrictions on what travelers can take on board aircraft. And governments around the world have expanded their domestic surveillance programs, giving them the power to tap phone calls as well as to read personal uh, emails. Uh, David Gartenstein Ross, has this been abused? Has these policies for national security, have they been abused? This is going to be a debate that people have for a long time because the problem set isn't going away. A problem set where small groups of individuals can do more damage than they ever have before uh, and where governments are trying to adapt, uh, sometimes uh, trying with their best efforts, sometimes uh, not doing so, uh, sometimes uh, uh, trying to uh, give themselves more powers under the pretext of fighting terrorism. Uh, but this is just inherently a problem that's going to be there. You talk about airports and full body scanners. Of course, the reason why we now have full body scanners in airports is because of an innovation that came out of Yemen, where the chief bomb maker of uh, uh, al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, Asiri, uh, was able to come up with an innovation called a crotch bomb. After that, uh, they, um, uh, mm -hmm. authorities had to figure out a way to stop the crotch bomb or mm -hmm. else to leave that vulnerability in place. Mm -hmm. Thus, they got full body scanners. So often, uh, this is a response to what violent non-state actors are doing. Mm -hmm. um, another good example, of course, is what you mentioned, surveillance, where uh, now with um, the explosion in encryption post Edward Snowden and to end encryption mm -hmm. and the like, uh, as well as the tradecraft that ISIL has been able to have, uh, they have massive networks uh, in Europe. You know, when you look at the Paris attack and then the Brussels attack, which came so close in proximity to each other, that's right. the first time that a single jihadist uh, terrorist cell was right. able to carry out one attack, then have the weight of European security and intelligence brought down upon them mm -hmm. and carry out another major attack. Like uh, five years ago, uh, uh, yeah. most terrorism analysts would have told you that uh, a network of this magnitude in Europe would have been impossible. So right. this is a debate that we're going to be having for a long time where those limits should lie. Right. That being the case, here's my final question to you, uh, Mr. Afshin uh, Shahi. Is the world a safer place now that we have the war on terror and the policies that are linked, linked to it? Of course, it would be extremely simplistic and reductionist to reduce all the problems that we have right now, uh, certainly in the Middle East and the wider Arab world, uh, to the so-called war against terror. But at the same time, I think it is fair and valid to assert that the policies which were affiliated to the idea of war against terror mm -hmm. has created a great deal of instability uh, in the region. I can talk specifically about the Middle East. The Middle East is more unstable today. There are at least three uh, failed states right now uh, in the region, mm -hmm. and these failed states are creating, uh, creating a lot of instability, a lot of chaos. And within this chaos, 
uh, organizations like the Islamic State, like Daesh, are rising and creating a lot of problems, a lot of security imp impediments, right. not only for the countries within the Middle East, but certainly uh, for the wider uh, global context. Unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for in contributing to the discussion. Thank you to all our guests, David Gartenstein, Ross, Afshin Shahi, and Ahmed Musali. And thank you to you too for watching. You can watch the program again anytime by visiting our website. And for further discussion, you can always go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can always join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Fauzia Ibrahim, and the whole team, thanks for watching.